so here I am in a Boundary Break episode, looking at the worst school in the country to find secrets and new discoveries. And I'm hearing rumors that this guy She Says and Swegta are planning to talk about me and tell you stuff you're not supposed to hear. Well, She Says, as long as you keep the facts straight for you and your audience, there won't be any problems. And you better thank the boss 54320 for his hard work making the camera, or I promise you, you'll wish you did. As long as we got an understanding, we're good to go. Let's go see what you guys found. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much, Jimmy Hopkins, or should I say, Jerry Rosenthal, the voice of Jimmy Hopkins, for guesting on this show. A uh, message from him at the end of the episode, but for now, let's get started on the episode. All right, so the first thing that I want to look at is actually not even something that's the main game. It's one of the arcade games, Future Street Race. What's really interesting is that every single one of these futuristic street cars seems to have something that's hidden by the developers. Taking the camera up close can show you that there's tiny wheels on every single side, which can indicate one of two things. Either A, these vehicles were supposed to have wheels at some point, which I find to be a little less likely given the design of these vehicles. And what I feel is more likely is that every single vehicle that's in this game are tied to wheels. And so to make it function like a vehicle with four wheels, there has to be four wheels attached to the object. And since the developers don't want that in the game, they've shrunk the wheels down to such a size that the normal player can't see them. Oh yeah, also here's a zoom out of the entire track in one shot. All right, let's take a look at a couple things that are out of bounds. First of all, every time you go outside of a building, there is a texture that's used to represent whatever environment you're supposed to be looking at once you step outside. It's actually kind of cool. Each texture is uniquely crafted to represent whatever that environment's supposed to be. And reflections work in all sorts of ways. For example, the floor right here is slightly mirrored. But taking the camera down below will show you that it's modeled down there and that the floor that you stand on is really just a level of transparency. However, the same cannot be said for how mirrors work in the game. Although Bully is an unusual case and you can explore quite a bit of the mirrored image before it ends up disappearing, these mirror images are bound to a box. And once the camera steps outside the box, the mirrored reflection disappears. I guess this is a good time to mention that I got help from a YouTuber that specializes in Bully, and Bully fans that have looked for content on YouTube might recognize the name Swagta. Definitely recommend checking out his links in the video description. But anyways, he provided a little bit of extra footage for this episode. And one of the coolest things is leftover elements of a beta version of the boys dorm. See, it was initially planned to have two floors and in an attic, and there was going to be several accessible rooms that would have been on the second floor, alongside a bathroom with a mirror reflection. That reflection still remains where the second floor would have been, and there's also an area transition point inside of the dorm exterior where the attic would have been which takes you to the interior. Also at the very bottom of most environments, there seems to be these mysterious triangles. They don't have textures per se, I guess they technically do, but the textures are the names of textures, and if I had to speculate as to what these triangles were meant for, I would probably say that they're tied to the sound. I say this because they're labeled as things like solid wood or concrete. Or like inside of this prize tent here, you're gonna walk all over what is obviously wood, and then far below that is another triangle that says wood dock. Now let's talk about all the various things you can find in cutscenes throughout the game. First of all, the developers at Rockstar loved to store their actors underneath the ground. Like in this cutscene here for the mission, the setup, we have the bully that comes into the scene stored right underneath where he's supposed to show up. In fact, at this angle, you can see the exact moment that he's called in. And in this scene with Pete, he gets hit so hard that the kid buried his own grave. But if I'm being serious for a second, when he was off camera, once again, he was being stored underneath the ground, even though there's a full animation cycle here that's being played out that you can't see because he's not being shown at all angles. And even though there's just way too many examples to count, here's one here where you can see both characters being stored in the same general area, stuck on their first frame of animation. And then here's an example of a character that's no longer being used throughout the rest of the cutscene. So therefore, you can see a great example of what I mentioned earlier, of the models just simply being stored underneath the ground so that they can't be accidentally seen during the cutscene. Here's a technical goof that was hidden pretty well by the the developers. During this scene when Jimmy's looking at the boxing poster, there's a brief moment during the cutscene in which Jimmy stops animating. Now when you play the game yourself, you can notice that he stops moving, and if you pan the camera out just a little bit further, you can see that Jimmy is in fact in an A pose, not something that's terribly common in this game. And speaking of posters, Ernest's campaign poster has a really interesting tidbit attached to it as well. See in truth there are two posters, and each one serves a different purpose. For the first part of this cutscene, you're looking at a fully intact poster. 
Now you want that so that the player can't see a potential crease or cut in the poster itself, but you're going to need a cut or crease in the poster for what's to come next. And that's when the bullies rip the poster off. And so what happens in this exact moment is that the first poster swapped out with the new poster, and you can see the rippable version of the poster being stored out of bounds. Also, in this one scene, there's this swimming program that Pete's trying to watch, and in the cutscene, Gary gets in the way for most of the entire scene. So, here's what all those images look like without any character obstructing it. Here's a scene that's particularly weird because there's a lot of actors being used in it, and you'll see that whenever a group is not used during the cutscene, they're frozen in place. Now, if you've been following along pretty well, you should already know why this is the case. I just thought I'd show it off to you guys because it gives off a really uncanny vibe. Almost like a Disney animatronic performance. And then here's an example of unused content. This is something that you're not allowed to see as the player, but at a certain point during development, Jimmy was supposed to be shown outside the door, listening in on the conversation. And this is evidenced by the fact that the frame that Jimmy's frozen on is one of him listening in. And then he's animated to move his hand down and start walking through the door. And you can tell by the way that he warps to the door that this animation was probably meant to be closer to the door itself. Something about it must have been a little bit awkward to look at, and so these few frames of animation are completely unused. Also, fun fact, in the very same cutscene, you can see that it shares the same loading zone as several rooms. It seems as though all these rooms are meant for the multiplayer mode of the Wii version of Bully, with the fact that the comic book shop has exclusive content for those multiplayer modes. Since we're on the subject of shared rooms, I thought it'd be very interesting to show you that all the carnival games share the same loading zone, and so panning the camera out can show you all of them at the same time. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at areas that you can normally only get a glimpse of or you have no access to at all. Now, if you've never played the game before and you're just being a cool fan, uh, you, let me explain what's going on here. Students can come in and out of these rooms, but your main character cannot walk through the doorway even when they open the doors. There's an invisible barrier, and so for a very brief moment you might be able to peek inside. And what you're looking at now are all these rooms that are very difficult to check out. And pretty much all of them are filled with reused assets, such as beds that are not modeled on all sides, low poly objects like this clock, and especially this baseball, woof. But you know, normally you don't get close enough to ever get a good look at this, so this sort of resource management is absolutely acceptable. And then there's the basement of the comic shop, and just giving you a peek inside can show you there's a lot of machinery going on in here, as well as a couple of valves. And then there's a mission where you have to throw eggs inside Tad's house. And he's normally peeking through the windows, but I wanted to show you real quick that if you take the camera inside of the house, you can see how the floor is textured, which in my opinion is not very well. And the developers have stored Tad right in the dead center of the house so that he can warp to any window that the developers needed whenever you threw the eggs. Also, why the heck not? Let's do a zoom out of Tad's house real quick so you can see the neighborhood from an eagle's eye view. It's nice, isn't it? All right, well anyways, the janitor's closet's kind of interesting. There's really not much in here at all, and I've never seen this door open personally, but inside there's a single gate for draining, and if I give you a second to take a listen, you can hear those unique sound effects of water dripping and such. I really love bunnies. And then I found this to be pretty crazy. There's an unused, unique barricade that's in the game. Normally you're barred off from going into the city until much later, but once you do have access to the city, you can absolutely travel all the way to the carnival. However, the developers at one time may have wanted you to have access to the town, but not the carnival. Because if you were to sequence break the game and go all the way to where the carnival should be, the tunnel is closed off. And now I'm gonna bring Swig to on. You didn't think I was just gonna use his footage, right? I, I really wanted him to be on the show. So to round out this segment, I figured I'd have him show off four clips that he collected himself. And he has some very interesting information to share. Some of the rooftops in the camp plant are actually solid. It is possible the townies were meant to spawn on them and throw projectiles or use long-range weapons against Jimmy during the mission busting in part 2. The camp plant main building also has a solid catwalk you can walk on. And here's another fun fact. The game places these screens of the outside world map behind most interior doors to create the illusion that you can see a glimpse of the exterior when you're exiting a building. This is an unused screen that was supposed to be placed behind a now-removed Kemplant building interior door leading to one of the rooftops. The go-kart racetrack at Billy Crane's Traveling Carnival doesn't fit the area it's supposed to be placed in, and because of this, it's placed in a different location with a few details from the carnival area to make it appear as though you're still at the carnival when you're playing the go-kart race minigame. Just 
like the go-kart racetrack at the carnival, the junkyard and the long path leading to it don't fit their intended location. As a result, you're teleported to an alternate version of this part of the map after Johnny Vincent confronts you during the mission The Rumble. And by using an in-game trainer to get out of the junkyard, you can travel back to where the mission's second cutscene takes place and see an unfinished version of that part of the map. And there are some interesting details to be seen. You cannot find any pedestrians or vehicles. Some of the buildings have different textures, a lot of invisible walls for some reason, a ton of missing details, and some texture issues. The Spaz Industries factory upper floor is partially solid and even has a button you can use to open a door. If you use the levitation glitch to get up there and explore, then it's a good idea to use your slingshot to see what parts are solid. Equip it, and then fire a shot. If the projectile goes through any surface, then you can be assured it's not solid. If it actually hits the surface, then go ahead, walk. Alright, let's pick up a couple of loose ends before we wrap up this episode. A lot of interesting things that didn't really fit into a category I felt, but I did feel it was pretty cool stuff. First of all, we have the bus driver here. Now, obviously, you can get a glimpse of this in-game, but it all happens so fast that you may not even realize that the bus driver is a 2D texture. Slowing down the footage and taking the camera over can show you that he's not only a texture, but he's, in fact, two textures overlapping each other. And what's even better than that is that the developers overcompensated for the texture that goes down to his torso. See, they already made the bus driver texture, but they wanted to make sure that there was no conceivable angle in which you could see that his torso ends. And so what they did here is they took about a third of his torso and stretched it out really, really wide just in case, which leaves you with a bus driver that has no legs. Here's the backside of the bicycle shop. Now, most of the bikes in the game are fully 3D modeled, but for the display bikes that you can't reach, they're composed of contorted 2D textures. If you ever looked up in the sky in the game, you can see things that maybe in your mind resemble airplanes. And taking the camera all the way up here can show you that they are in fact airplanes. Well, some are at least. The most detailed one here is composed of three separate textures and for whatever reason seems a bit translucent. And then the planes that are even further away than that have been reduced to just floating triangles. And one of the features that's in this game is that you can hide in various places to avoid either fights or authority. And one of those places that you can hide in is a porta potty. And just like every place that you hide in in this game, it takes you into a first person perspective. But moving the camera around here can show you that Jimmy is in fact inside the porta potty, but his perspective is not your perspective. And when you move the camera outside the porta potty, you can see that the player's camera is actually sticking outside the porta potty and is housed inside of a new geometry that the player normally can't see in full. Inside the Harrington house, there's an unused texture. See, in this building, there's an outdoor area. And when you look around, you can see tree lines a little bit, it's kind of foggy, but when you take the camera all the way over there, you'll see that there's no sky in the background, which may explain for the excess amount of fog. But interestingly, if you take the camera on the opposite side of the trees, you'll see that the texture for the mountains was flipped, and so therefore the player could never see them because they're facing the wrong side. And lastly, I wanted to show you Bullworth at every stage of level of detail. And again, if you're new to the show and you're not too familiar with game development, very commonly in open world games, the amount of polygons used on an object is significantly reduced the further away you get. And here in Bully, there are three stages to Bullworth Academy, and I'm gonna show that to you right here. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, and big thank you to the patrons that are helping to support the show. Shoutouts to the incredible generosity by Erwin, Steven, and the Unknown Gamer. Thank you to Svegta for guesting on the show. I added him in my video description, so if you just click on that, you should be able to get to his channel. Guarantee you will not be disappointed. And lastly, thank you Jerry Rosenthal for guesting on this episode. I asked if he would share what's going on in his life, and uh, here's what he had to say hey everybody out there jerry rosenthal here aka jimmy hopkins want to thank she says for having me for those of you who don't know i am pretty much a full-time musician these days i uh as much as i love acting and voice acting and all that my life uh took a different path and if you want to check out some of the stuff i'm up to you can go to my website jerryrosenthal.com there's links to instagram that's at jerry rosenthal music same with YouTube, Facebook, all that. It's all at Jerry Rosenthal Music. Also, since the bulk of my income is live music performance, and obviously that's not really happening right now because of COVID, I've been teaching lessons online, guitar, bass, piano. So if you're interested in taking lessons from Jimmy Hopkins, go to my website and, uh, and send me a message. We'll try to make that happen. All right. Thanks so much. Take care of each other. Take care of yourself. And I hope to see you around. Peace.